Well, greetings and salutations, SIE test takers. This is Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. A uh, shout out to the Notman Marks team. Uh, they have uh, given me permission to share with you an SIE a practice uh, test. Uh, as you know, it's one of the favorite uh, pieces of content on the YouTube channel. Uh, I'll put this in there. As you know, we have several practice tests from several vendors. And this gives you an opportunity. It's a buffet. Take what you like, uh, leave what you don't, but it gives you a chance to see some different style of how people ask different test prep vendors, ask certain questions. It gives me a chance to uh, explicate and comment on correct answers and why they're right and why wrong answers are wrong. Uh, Notman Marks has also been kind enough to uh, give you a 10%, my viewers, a 10% discount. I'll put that discount code as in the video description and the link, as well as a link to uh, the SIE content, uh, other content that's available to you. As you know, in the practice text explications, what you should do is hit pause, answer, hit play, and see how you did. And does it sound like Dean is speaking some foreign language to you, or do you have a general understanding of it? This is my first exposure to the exam. As soon as I get permission, I, I put them up and do it. So I'll, I'll comment as well on whether I think it's, you know, high probability, low probability, and what you could expect in that regard as well. All right, well, let's get started. An economic downturn, an economic downturn, where real domestic uh, product declines by more than 10%. Now, the one I would want you to be aware of on the actual exam is two calendar quarters of declining GDP can best be described or defined as a recession. Six calendar quarters of declining GDP would be a depression, and 10% is also going to be a depression. I like uh, Will Rogers' definition. Will Rogers said, a recession is when your neighbor's out of work and a depression is when uh, you're out of work. Uh, number two, a registered rep has changed his address. What is now required for this rep to do? So any amendment to a U4 needs to be done within 30 days. So, you know, anything the way I think of it is anything that was a new change in information. More importantly on the test, any no answer that becomes a yes answer. And so the answer there is uh, B. Uh, three, the policy that relies heavily on the use of interest rates. Now, if anybody ever asks you about economics, finance, or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you sound smart. Somebody says, well, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They say, is that good news or bad news? You say it depends. Now, you're going to be tested on monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy is the money supply. You know, too much money chasing too few goods, that's inflation, that's bad. Too many goods and not enough money is deflation, that too is bad. And so the missions of the Federal Reserve Board, test question, they're in charge of monetary policy. And they use interest rates to do that. That's the answer to this question. And I would definitely know, you know, the impact on the money supply when the Fed's open market committee buys and sells government securities. But their dual mission is price stability and full employment. And right now, the Fed has been able, is telling people, right now we're more interested in price stability than we are in terms of uh, full employment, and they're raising uh, interest rates. Uh, we definitely know fiscal policy is government spending and taxation controlled by Congress and the president. And Lord John Maynard Keynes says that when we're in a down cycle, when the economy is weak, that one of the reasons is a lack of demand. And people who have resources won't spend them, and other people would don't don't have any resources, and so the government can step on the accelerator called government spending to stimulate demand. Mr. Keynes, if he's still around, would have been happy with the you know those pandemic checks that uh, were sent out. Uh, number four, which of the following practices are in violation of FINRA rules? Uh, assuring a customer that the firm will make the customer whole. If the value of the securities falls below the purchase price, absolutely not. You know, this is supposed to be your risk capital, the kind of capital you can afford to lose. So uh, that's not very helpful in the answer set because I still have room in a row in three of those. Uh, loaning loan to another of the firm's rep if permitted by the firm. Yeah, if your firm allows that, then that's okay. A holiday cash gift of $100. The gift of gratuity rule is $100. To employ the clearing firm? Yeah, that's fine. So it is C. Uh, five, for a two-year period following the termination of a FINRA 
uh, member firm, a registered uh, rep. So the way we say this, it's kind of a legalese, is they retain jurisdictional retention. So, you know, I, uh, you know, retired from the uh, industry, you know, I still was uh, subject to FINRA, my FINRA for, uh, district was district one. So two years from my retirement, I'm supposed to cooperate with them. I'm not considered outside of their jurisdictional retention. And so here the uh, answer is A. Uh, I don't think it's the address change you should worry about. It's this two year jurisdictional retention thing that I'm bringing up. Yeah, that's pretty tough for an SIE. I'm wishing for you a dream draw of the SIE. Everything you studied shows up and you go, man, I don't know what the big deal is. <laughs> you know, so. uh, characteristics of private activity bonds. So, you know, private activity bonds are also known as industrial development revenue bonds. And, uh, you know, this is not like building a high school. This would be where, for example, uh, Schwab has an 80 acre campus that Denver's Industrial Development Agency uh, built for Schwab. And so, you know, Schwab corporate credit is what backs those bonds. Long Tree, Denver are not on the hooks for the bonds. And these are subject to what we call the alternative minimum tax. So in terms of suitability, I would ask somebody before I recommend to them a private activity bond, private activity industrial development or industrial development agency bond, uh, hey, are you subject to the AMT? Because if so, you shouldn't do it. Now, since that's the case, you know, they might provide a higher yield than other municipal bonds. And so it might be a good value, assuming you're not subject to the AMT because people shy away from them, right? So uh, Roman numeral one is uh, true. Uh, the trade with a lower yield. Now, test taking trick, uh, I don't see that they give us one and two of the same answer for, uh, universe, but this is called the principle of mutual exclusion. It can't be one and two in the same universe. It's either higher or lower. They are often subject to the alternative minimum decks. Ding, 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 ding. That is uh, definitely uh, the case. Uh, another one that's very similar, another one that's very similar are uh, public pur purpose not essential, which would be like a stadium. Uh, which of the following terms is most interchangeable with a listed option? And, you know, the thing about option contracts is they're standardized, right? And so you can trade them very easily. So interchangeable with listed option, because listed is means it's, SIBO. So that's why A is better than D. So that one's kind of tricky, uh, but uh, you can trade it. Remember, you did an opening sale, you can do a closing purchase, you do an opening uh, uh, opening uh, purchase, you can do a closing sale, and I would definitely know those types of orders. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> a client now in her fifth year of retirement is considering an investment in a Reg D offering. So that's a private placement. And you should know that's an exempt transaction under 33. And you should know that to participate in that, you should be accredited. And you should have a million dollars net worth exclusive of your primary residence. Or if you're meriting filing jointly, I don't see any husband here or significant other, uh, 200,000 for the last two years with the expectation of that this year or 300,000 uh, filing jointly. So. She has made similar investments in the past, particularly during the last five years of her employment, when she was earning 200,000 per year during that time period. If she chooses to pursue the investment, she would be considered an accredited investor. Yes, and she satisfied the income requirement in the most two recent years of her employment. No. No, she is no longer working and would thus be unable to handle financial risk. Well, that may be true, but that's not what we're looking for, where she's either going to be accredited or, or she's not. And so A, she's not accredited. B, doesn't speak to accreditation. Uh, C, yes, since she has an investment history of purchasing Reg D. No, it, well, just because at one point she was accredited doesn't mean she currently is. Uh, D, no given, no, given there cannot be a reasonable expectation, she'll continue to satisfy. Yeah, I uh, think Notman, uh, you know, sometimes uh, Notman's trying to stretch her mind and hope it doesn't go back to the same spot. Uh, the vast majority of the SIE is recognition. So make sure you definitely know uh, that uh, that definition of an accredited investor. Uh, number nine, a six-year-old customer wants to take a tax-free qualified Roth IRA distribution. So you remember, Senator Roth is no longer here to protect his uh, Roth IRA, but you know the Roth is uh, pretty sweet. You know, there's no required minimum distributions. I would know that. 
If she made her first um, first Roth contribution for taxable year 2009, when is she permitted to start taking qualified distributions? And so remember, you can do that after you're 59 and a half, and it has to be in that fifth year. So the trick here is there's no 2013. So we're going to go for the 2014, right? It's a five-year period. Uh, 10. All the following statements regarding public non-traded REITs are true except, wow. So public means uh, we're selling it to retail investors. Non-traded means unlike a REIT that trades on the New York, there is no secondary market. So that's what that means in English. It's kind of like learning a foreign language and they say when you dream the foreign language, that's when you know it, right? They are subject to registration and disclosures uh, requirements of 33. This is an accept question, and that is true, right? It says public, and if you're making a distribution, a primary distribution of securities to the public, you're definitely subject to 33. That's what 33 is, the Paper or Prospectus Act. Uh, they do not trade in the secondary market. That's true because that's what the non-traded means. They are typically illiquid. They are typically illiquid. Yeah, uh, yeah, they're not liquid because they're not trading in the secondary market. They're usually short-term investments. No, real estate is typically a longer-term investment. So the answer to 10 is D, D. If the FBI requests that a broker-dealer provide private customer information in support of an ongoing anti-money laundering investigation, so very testable in your SID to know that the Bank Secrecy Act gives the financial institution the permission to give your information to regulatory authorities. Now, again, if it's in the properly done, right? So we want to see what's going on. The broker dealer is obligated to protect the privacy of its customer by not providing the requested information. No. Provide the information with FINRA's permission. No. Uh, provide information to support the investigation. I think on the test, it'll be a little clearer than that. And then uh, make sure you know the three stages of money laundering, placement, layering, integration. Make sure you know about the SAR. The SAR is 5,000 or more. Commercial is logical, goes to FinCEN. Know the CTR, 10,000, exceeds 10,000. Again, goes to FinCEN. So expect uh, some questions there. No red flags. Transactions commercially logical would be a red flag. Origin of the funds. So uh, make sure you're pretty good on that anti-money laundering. You know, the firm has to have in its written supervisory procedures. It's a, a process for anti-money laundering. We have an AML, AML officer and we test uh, annually. So make sure beef up on that. Uh, 12, an insurance company's separate account. So, you know, don't tell a compliance officer I said this. I think of a mutual fund, uh, excuse me, a variable annuity as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. A mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. And that separate account is the mutual fund. It's not directly managed by its investment manager. So, you know, a lot of insurance companies that sell variable annuities will uh, farm out the to, uh, to the uh, investment advisory firm the actual day-to-day -day managing of the money in the separate account. I know that's what this question is about, but let's see. Uh, registered as an open-end company, investment company on the Investment Company Act of 1940. I like that, but it says it's not directly managed. So that's kind of a hint that it's kind of an oddball, right? Uh, it's not registered on the investment company. Registers is closed in, no. Registers in Unit Investment Trust on the Unit uh, Investment Company Act of 1940. This one is really tough, really tough. And if it said they were actively managing it, I would go for A. We'll see if I get this right. I'm going to go for D. And I'm going for D because of this uh, phraseology uh, that says uh, not directly managed by the investment managers. And again, I will I'll put the answer game in the video description for you. Uh, 13, all of the following disclosures, all of the following disclosures are likely to be found in the margin account disclosure page given to customers, except, so A, they can exceed the amount contributed. Absolutely, right? Leverage works both ways. The same supercharge speed you're making money with is the same supercharge speed you're losing money with. So that's definitely true. Uh, customers are not entitled to extensions of time for a margin call. No, we may or may not grant you an extension. You know, If you're a customer in good standing, it's more likely we will, but we don't have to do that. 
Uh, by the way, you know, Federal Reserve Board says customers get two additional days. So it would be T plus two between broker dealers and the customer gets two additional days. That's when I may or may not get you an extension. Uh, the broker dealer can sell out the securities of the account without notice. Uh, that too is true. And by the way, if you have bought that security and you don't pay for it and I sell you out, you know, I have to give you a profit. If by the time I do that, there's a profit, then I'm going to freeze your account. I'm going to say you took a free ride. You bought and sold a security you didn't pay for. And so now your account is frozen for the next 90 days. You have no credit privileges. Uh, the broker dealer can increase house maintenance requirements, but only if advance written notice is given. Now we, we can do that in the original documentation. We tell you that we can do that anytime. You know, for example, uh, the Schwab customers are probably thinking Schwab at this point, but they were really upset when Schwab changed the margin requirements on the fly on uh, GameStop, right? So yeah, we can do that on the fly. Uh, if a customer's order, if a customer's order was filled in the third market, so this is uh, definitely recognition. The third market are listed securities traded over the counter. Listed securities traded over the counter. So, for example, uh, if it's a New York Stock Exchange stock. Like, oh, I don't know, like uh, Twitter used to trade on New York. And if this is a Twitter trade when Twitter was public and it took place elsewhere, that would be a third market trade. All right, so now let's look at our answer set. Should be the same or better that was available in the securities primary listing market. So, yeah, you know, if you're going to be doing trading in the third market and, you know, and you know that there, New York is there, you know, the price you're doing it at should be as good as New York if that's the primary market center. So that sounds pretty good. Is it the discretion of the OTC marketplace? No. Uh, will usually be inferior to what was available in the securities primary listing market? No. If that were true, it wouldn't be a huge marketplace. Would depend on the market? No. Uh, given that answer set, uh, looks like A is our best answer. 15. XYZ Mutual Fund offers a dividend reinvestment plan. Uh, a lot of us refer to this as a drip. A drip. D-R-I-P. So, you know, you yeah, people do encounter questions about dividend reinvestment programs. When an investor chooses to reinvest the dividend, so I tell XYZ Mutual Fund, I don't need the money to just buy me additional fund shares. The IRS says, Dean, as far as we're concerned, you could have had the money, and that's the same as getting it. And so, yeah, there's going to be a tax liability. Uh, I have had a debrief where people have seen a question very similar to this one. So, you know, I don't know if you want to red flag this one or TQ it as something to return circle back on, right? So this is called constructive receipt. By the way, it'd be the same on the capital gains, right? If I tell them there's a capital gains distribution, I tell them I don't need it. Just buy me more fund shares. And that's assuming, again, it's in a personal account. So uh, 15 is B, very testable. And what type of economic environment our bond uh, bond investors most vulnerable in interest rate risk. Well, boy, this is current today, right? We just had a major bank. I'm coming to you on March uh, what 12th, March 10th, 2023. I know the internet lives forever, uh, but we just had a major. Well, it's not major. People are saying it's not major, but for me, it was. I spent most of my career in the Bay Area, and Silicon Valley Bank was a you know a player. Anyways, they had a bond portfolio. Wouldn't be a problem. They could hold it to maturity, but they had to meet uh, withdrawal requests and they had to sell their portfolio bonds. And uh, since they bought them, rates have gone up, causing their bonds to go down. And so, boy, were they exposed to interest rate risk for sure, right? So, A, you should definitely know about that inverse relationship uh, with interest rate risk. Interest rates go up, bond prices go down. I joke, if you want to sound smart, somebody asks you about economics, finance, or investment, investments say it has a lot to do with interest rates. If you just shut up, you sound good. Somebody says, what about them? You say they fluctuate. Uh, 17. A customer sells XYZ stock, a customer sells XYZ stock, which was purchased by the broker dealer's inventory. So we're talking about a market maker here. And so if you're selling, remember, you get the low price. Whenever a customer is looking at two prices, the low price and the high price, the customer always sells at the low price, always buys at the high price. What's that called? The securities industry. I'm joking. The customer sells at the bid and buys at the ask. The customer's confirmation, this is called capacity. This is very testable. And so the answer is uh, D, we act in our principal capacity and we bought it from you. So that's a markdown. Uh, definitely testable. We all call broker dealers. I say, listen, at Merrill Lynch, we're a broker dealer. 
Some transactions at Merrill Lynch will be acting in our broker agency capacity, charging the commission. On your behalf, we're going to get the security elsewhere. And other transactions you do with Merrill Lynch will be acting in our dealer principal capacity. We'll be charging you a markup or a mark, markdown. And each and every transaction will tell you what we're doing. 18, a broker dealer obtains information uh, about a group of clients' financial objectives and needs and has recommended the same model portfolio for all clients in the group. Which of uh, following is true? of this practice. No, uh, I'm one of the few people out there who te teaches uh, test taking tricks. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn the information and you should always use your test taking tricks when all else fails. But one test taking trick is too long to be wrong. You know, and it looks like this B choice, woo. So I don't know who at not and Marx writes the questions, but boy, he likes be a right, be a, a lot. This practice is permitted. This is called blanket recommendations. And blanket recommendations are a prohibited practice because everybody's financial situation is unique. Uh, so that's out. A is out. Uh, B, this practice is not permitted because the suitability standard has to be applied to individual client. There you go. No blanket recommendations. So that is B. Uh, 19. An investor is likely to put, now don't, you know, this is an editorial decision. If you're going on to take a series seven, you know, there's no uh, sunken intellectual costs on your SIE because you're, you know, you get the, a lot of questions, like 20 or so. In the SIE, three or four on options. And you should have a basic understanding of contract specifications, that there are two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can buy them or sell them. So we have four basic option positions. And when I purchase a put, I have a choice to sell the stock. So this is asking me under which of the following situations would I want to have a choice to sell a stock? And uh, A, yeah, that sounds pretty good, right? I definitely want to have a choice to sell a stock that I have a gain on. I might want to buy some insurance, buy a protective put. Absolutely. Uh, if I just buy the put, I don't have the stock. Uh, I'm bearish. I could profit from the stock going down. Yeah. And by the way, that's a smarter way to be a bear because if I buy a put and the stock doesn't go down, I just lose my premium, which is a lot smarter than shorting the stock or doing a naked call which have unlimited risk potential. So B is true. Uh, to prevent a long stock from losing money. Yeah, that's what we, we said. You know, you don't have to have a profit. You could put in this floor or put in this insurance right out of the gate. So C is true. No, generate income. You should definitely know that buying options is money out. So that's not income. So protection is going to be money out. Income is money in. So D, and no, to get income, you sell the option. You don't buy the option. So 19 is D, 20. An investor has received a dividend from mutual fund holding and the dividend is reinvested. I think we got this uh, earlier, something very similar. Uh, what of the following statements are true? Well, dividends are taxed at uh, ordinary income. Uh, that's true. So we're looking for that. Let's see, we got uh, two choices. That gives us a 50-50. And uh, you have to pay that tax, as, uh, tax now. And it's going to cause the cost basis to go down. I wouldn't worry about the cost base here, but I would definitely know it's going to be taxed at ordinary uh, income. And the cost base is increased. Uh, which of the statement is true of a bond in fault? Remember, bonds is a promise to pay interest in principle. And once the bond defaults, it trades without a calculation of accrued interest. And the whole idea of me, the buyer, paying you, the seller, the accrued interest is that I'm going to get a check and it's for the entire six month time frame, and you, the seller, have owned it for that. But if you didn't get paid because the bond's in default, what makes you think I'm going to get paid? And so now the bond trades flat. And what that means in English is no calculation of accrued interest. No calculation of accrued interest. A uh, municipal note that is typically funded by non tax revenue. Well, I, I kind of, you know, this is kind of an interesting one. You know, we have TANS, tax anticipation notes, tax anticipation, so that's definitely tax. And non-tax revenue would be a revenue anticipation note. So kind of funky, kind of funky. Uh, which of the following regarding statutory disqualification? Statutory disqualification means you uh, can't be a broker. You know, these are yes answers on the U4. There's not many of them. 
any yes answer requires an explanation, but any of the that are not yes answers to statutory disqualification, they have given an explanation about why you can't be a broker. So we're out looking here for big deals. Uh, individuals subject uh, may be subject to a statutory disqualification. Yeah, conviction of a felony, for example, within the last 10 years. Uh, certain persons may re-enter or continue in the securities industry following a statutory disqualification. Yes, they, they can get permission to get back in the industry. If you repented, you paid your penance. I'm joking, but you can get back in. Three, disqualifying events can include bars, injunctions, suspensions, expulsions. Yes. Once it becomes aware of a statutory disqualifying event, the member is obligated to report that to FINRA. Yes, one, two, three, and four. A uh, company can declare dividends in which of the following ways? Cash, yep, stock of a subsidiary company, absolutely. Uh, goods produced by the company, that's called a property dividend. For years, uh, back in the day, Wrigley's gum would give its uh, shareholders a case of gum as a property dividend. So it is all of the above, all of the above. Uh, what I'd be aware of is cash uh, dividends are taxable, stock dividends are not. Uh, 25, FINRA member firms must retain records of all retail communications, including principal reviews and approvals, for how long? The vast majority of brokerage firm records are three-year records. So if you have to guess, I wouldn't want you to guess, but if you do, three is a good guess. Uh, five years is uh, money laundering records. The AML records are five years, the CTRs, the uh, SSRs, that kind of stuff. Customer complaints are four, items of original entry are six, and then there are certain lifetime records, uh, stock certificates, partnership agreements, articles of incorporations, minutes of directors uh, meetings. Uh, 26, in a cash account, a customer purchases a security and sells the same security without first paying for the original purchase. Ooh. This sounds like a free ride. You bought and sold. You didn't pay for the buy. That means you use broker-dealer money, not your own money. And that's called a free ride. Uh, again, my friends at Nomin Marks are going to be upset with Dean pointing out again, too long to be wrong. <laughs> right? uh, a, it's permissible as long as the sale proceeds cover the purchase. Uh, B, it's a violation of Reg T and FINRA free riding rules. and will cause the account to be frozen and the broker-dealer will hold the sale proceeds until the original transaction has been paid. So, yeah, remember the freeze is going to be 90 days, no credit privileges. Uh, which of the following statements is correct? You are definitely going to get a question about how ETFs and ETNs are different. So this is a very good question. I like this question a lot. Both ETNs, exchange traded notes, and exchange traded funds have ownership interest. And big time test fodder. The note is a debt instrument. The ETF is not. The ETF does actually own those things. Uh, ETNs own the securities in the portfolio where ETFs not. Eh. ETFs own the securities, whereas ETNs do not, and they are unsecured. I like that by definition. That's a good one. You might want to, if you're taking notes, I highly recommend, well, well we're question 27 now, but you might want to take some notes as we go through these explications. And boy, this is a good one. I would make a flashcard. That's pretty spot on, something you could expect to see on your SIE. Uh, if international interest rates have been rising while US rates are falling, so when US rates are falling, the dollar goes down, right? The dollar becomes more attractive as interest rates go up. So I wouldn't worry about international rates. That's not really the point. It's what's happening to US rates that is meaningful in the question. And so I just told you that what that means is the dollar is going to go down, right? So what happens when the dollar goes down? International investment, and U.S. securities uh, will increase. No, right? Because if you can get higher rates overseas, you're more likely to invest there. So that is not true. U.S. investors will increase their international investments. Yeah, because remember, I can get more overseas. So two is true. The U.S. dollar will strengthen. No, he said the U.S. dollar is not going to strengthen. It's going to weaken. So the answer is two and four. Uh, by the way, I would know that this would have a positive effect on the balance of trade, because when the dollar is weak, our exports become more competitive and imports become less competitive. Uh, for an equity trade, which of the following is not included on the customer confirmation? What is not included on the customer's confirmation? The bid and the ask? No. 
All you care is, did you pay, uh, receive the bid when you sold or did you pay the ask when you bought? So no, that's not on the confirmation. Trade date, certainly, yes. Transaction, certainly, uh, yes. And quantity, definitely, so A. Uh, Zach, a member firm of your sales team, a member of your sales team, excuse me, suggested that his client Monica purchase the Apple County Geo Bonds, maturing 2000. First call date, 2000, whatever, QSIP. The recommendation resulted from a careful review of Monica's investment profile. And in carrying out his due diligence, Zach le likely paid the least amount of information to Monica's prior investment experience. That's going to be really important. Uh, the date of birth, we're not supposed to open accounts with minors. That would be important. A need for current liquidity, that would be important. Her prior residential history, I mean, what's that got to do with anything? I think that's, uh, I call this the Sesame Street trick. One of these things is not like the other. And that's the one that's not like the other. Uh, SIPIC is very testable. SIPIC is very testable. Broker dealers have net worth requirements, net capital standards. They're not met. SIPIC, will, uh, SIPIC trustee will be appointed to uh, liquidate the firm. You should definitely know it's $500,000 of which no more than two fifty dollars can be cash per separate customer, every account with different beneficial ownership. Very testable. All the following are mu mu uh, features of mutual fund companies, except, so the keyword is except. They do not trade on national exchanges. They do not, they do not issue new shares after their IPO. Well, I like that one because remember, open-end funds are continually offering new shares to the public. So I'm going to go for that one. Let's see what my other choices are, but let's uh, put a placeholder on that one. Uh, investors pay the next calculated price. Very testable. That's called forward pricing. That's true. You should definitely know about forward pricing. We're always doing business based on the next calculation. Uh, they can issue equity securities only. Yeah, what we mean by that is they can only have one class. They get a different share class like loads, but... You know, they can only have one class of equity called common stock, one share, one vote. They can't issue preferred stock, for example, like a closed-end fund. So the answer is indeed B. 33. Uh, the amount of principal a bond investor can expect to be repaid at maturity uh, can be called any of the following except. I kind of like these except questions. Yeah, market value. No, that's not. All right. You should definitely know that's typically a 1,000. Right, par value is a thousand, face value is a thousand per bond, principal value is a thousand. Those are all synonymous terms. Uh, which of the following uh, factors is most impactful on a bond price? Which of the following is most impactful on a bond price? And the answer would be interest rates. Right, you have two uh, risk: credit risk and interest rate risk. The rating isn't the credit risk. Well, it's the credit rating is the likelihood of potential default. Right. So, you know, given this thing, you should definitely know interest rates. Wow. 35. This is more like a 24 question than an SIE question. I wonder if I'm doing the right exam. <laughs> you know? So when we form a municipal syndicate and I'm the uh, lead manager, I'm the one running all the books and I'm the one who has all the money. And so when I break syndicate, you'd probably like to be paid as a syndicate member in a timely fashion. And so what the MSRB says is that within 30 days, I got to settle up with my syndicate members. Uh, again, I don't know. I don't talk to the NOP and uh, subject matter experts and the people writing these tests. I'd be interested, you know, where this question came from. You know, who knows? Maybe somebody says they encountered it. Uh, Thirty-six. A uh, stop order is entered at uh, a sell two hundred and fifty shares stop at fifty-three seventy. So you know what this is. I'm telling my broker if the stock trades at or through fifty-three seventy, sell it. So the uh, means on fill. So that means if we didn't get hit the trigger, the trigger price here is 5370. We're looking for a trade at or through 5370. So now the question is saying, okay, so what? why didn't this happen? The order will convert on the next day. Now all orders are considered day orders unless we say differently. The customer says differently. The market price must be above. Well, no, you should know that sell stops are placed below the market price, right? So remember, this is kind of counterintuitive, but if the market price is above that, that's the correct answer because that means it will never get triggered. So we're placing the stop below. 
So this is a tricky version of where do you place orders in relationship to the current market price. So where I place this, the stock is somewhere above 5370. And now it's not triggered. So that means it never came through that trigger price. Well, that's a, that's a pretty tricky one. Very, very testable though. You're going to get a stop order question or two. Uh, 37. In which of the following scenarios does a registered rep not need written consent from their broker dealer? Written consent. You want to open an account elsewhere. You certainly need written consent. You're going to be selling uh, some other investment opportunity and you're going to be paid for it. Written consent. Uh, the, you're going to offer muni bonds to another broker dealer. Oh my God. You know, that's that's funky, but that's written consent. You've been named the beneficiary of a trust. Now that's not that's not an advert. We, the, te, the legal term is that's not an adverse interest. Those others are potential, what we call adverse interests. Uh, all the following are listing requirements on the New York Stock Exchange, except, oh man, you should not miss this because you should know the SEC neither approves nor disapproves of any securities offering. They neither pass upon the adequacy or the accuracy of the information contained herein. Any claim to the contrary is a criminal offense. That's the front page of every prospectus. So the two nasty words in the securities industry are, we never say anything is approved and we never say anything is guaranteed. Those are two nasty words. Shares acquired from the spouse of an affiliate in a private placement. So from the spouse of an affiliate in a private placement. So when you get securities in a private placement, those are unregistered securities. And when you have unregistered securities, there's a restriction that you must hold them for at least six months. And so those are restricted securities, restricted securities. According to industry rules, broker dealers that act as principals to buy or sell securities are required to buy and sell those securities at what prices? So they're asking about my bid and my ask. And, you know, my bid and ask should be fair. You know, if they ever ask you, should you be fair and reasonable about anything, you should say yes. You should never be unfair and unreasonable uh, about anything. Uh, which two of the following apply to the purchase of a closed-end fund? Which of the following? Uh, 12B1 fees? Now, 12B1 fees are associated with uh, open and mutual funds. And I would know that a promotional expense, a 12B1 fee is a promotional expense. I would know the most that you can charge and still refer to yourself as an OLED fund is 0 0.25, 25 basis points, one quarter, 1%. 1 but that's not about a closed-end fund. That has nothing to do with a closed-end fund. Surrender charges, there's no such thing as a surrender charge in a closed-end fund. So I've eliminated one, I've eliminated two. Does the fund have administrative costs? It certainly does. It has a transfer agent. For example, a registrar and, you know, and uh, commissions. Yeah, you're going to buy and sell it like a stock. And so the answer is uh, A, three and four. Uh, I would definitely be able to contrast open end and closed end funds uh, on your exam. Uh, 42. Miss Smith uh, buys one ABC July 70, call it two and a half. When the market's 71. So again, in these explications, what you're trying to decide, does this sound like a foreign language? So the stock's at 71. So the 70 call has one point of intrinsic value. Call up, the market price is up. I paid 250. As time passes, the market price remains stable at 71. Well, that's going to be a problem, right? Because I'm buying volatility. When you buy an option, you're making a bet on three things. Direction, here I'm choosing up. So volatility is your friend. You're buying volatility. I'm buying upward volatility. You got to be right about how far up. I got to at least cover my out-of-pocket costs, two and a half. And I got to be right about the timing. I'm saying all this is going to take place between now and the third Friday in July. And so now the stock doesn't move. And so I'm a loser. So the premium, therefore, will probably. So, you know, options are a wasting asset. Time value erodes. And at expiration, the option is only going to be worth its intrinsic value. So in this example, again, don't, you know, you got to just make editorial decisions about how much time you're going to spend on options for SIE, but it behooves you to spend time because on on the seven, this becomes a much bigger deal. But you know, here the two and a half I paid, I paid a, a point for intrinsic value, and I paid another point and a half for time value. And as we just said, that time value is going to go poof at the end. It's just worth its intrinsic value. 
All right, a UIT, a UIT uh, Union Investment Trust, the party that's responsible for the trust organization is the sponsor. And uh, UITs do show up. And what I would know about a UIT on your SIE is it's a fixed portfolio and it's passively managed, fixed portfolio, passively managed. Uh, 44, a registered rep can pay a portion of her commissions on trades to a business associate working in the same firm, providing we don't give concessions, discounts, allowances to people who are not registered. And so for you to be splitting commissions, that person has to be registered. Uh, a company uh, reverse splits its stock one for 10. So for every 10 shares, you now have one share. You know, this is embarrassing. GE did a 10 for one reverse. How embarrassing get the stock price to a respectable level. So if you had investor have, had 800 shares before the event, what will be the impact on split? Well, there's no change in your proportionate ownership. You know, this is kind of a marketing gimmick, so to speak, right? It's a marketing gimmick, and then we're getting the stock to go up. Uh, you know, in the, in the GE example, it went from 10 to, to, to 20. Anyways, uh, so here, what we're trying to trick you is make you think there's something going on besides this uh, marketing gimmick. And no, no, there's no change in proportional ownership. The total value doesn't change, right? I call that sometimes the, uh, you know, dead cat bounce because we do that. Maybe we do it a couple of times and, and stock goes, goes kaput. Uh, which two of the following statements are true regarding customers who invest in unit investment trust? And we said a unit investment trust, uh, they own the units in the trust. That's certainly true. Uh, they don't own shares. It's called a unit investment trust. The interest is not actively managed. That's what we said. One and three. I like this one. This is you know, very much what uh, people encounter on the test. Uh, I would tell you there's not multiples on the test, but in terms of uh, content, that content is spot on. Uh, 47. Uh, which of the following is not true about an investor who holds a LEAP? So, you know, LEAPs are long-term equity appreciation potential securities. And they're the only option contract that goes past, uh, well, technically 39 months in practice, 30. Uh, their contract performance is guaranteed by the OCC. That is true. That's true of all options, by the way. You should know that the OCC is the issuer and guarantor of all options. So A is very testable. And where this is saying not true, A is true. B, they may close out the position by selling in the marketplace anytime before expiration. Yeah, you can trade your option, right? That's certainly true. They're subject to unlimited risk. Well, that's not true unless it's a you know, naked leap call. And it doesn't say anything whether it's a call or not. Uh, the options have an expiration as long as three years. Yeah, I just told you that. So this is C. Uh, this is another one where I would probably suggest what I call a poor man's flashcard. And what I mean by a poor man's flashcard, C is the answer, is I would get rid of the not true. And, uh, you know, El Marco Adi, assuming you have a physical uh, printout of this PDF. So if you are using not min marks and you have this as a PDF, uh, I would print it out and give her the not true El Marco C. If you don't have not min marks and you're hitting pause, play, you know, answer. Uh, again, this is another one where I would suggest you want to probably make a note about a leap. I wouldn't be surprised if you see this information uh, on your test. Or this issuer and guarantor OCC, that stuff. 48, an investor who owns shares in ABC is notified of a rights offering. You know, you have a right to maintain your proportion ownership in the uh, corporation. And the mechanism we use for that is called a rights offering. And you definitely need to know the rights are short term and that issuance exercisable below the current market price. And so you've decided you're not going to participate, you're not going to maintain your proportion ownership. So that means they're going to sell the stock elsewhere. And so indeed, you're going to be diluted because there's going to be more shares outstanding after the rights offering. You must sell all your shares. And she will acquire more shares. What's well, said, you're not participating, right? So if you're not participating, uh, the investor says, oh, I'm, my bad. If the investor decides to participate, right? There we go. So I was on the backside of the question. Her stake in the ownership will not be diluted. Yeah, if you participate, you will have maintained proportion and ownership. And you're going to have to send in your check and your rights to the rights or transfer agent. And so the answer to that is uh, one and three. Uh, you should also be able to contrast rights with warrants. You should know that warrants are long-term and exercisable at issuance above the current market price. A uh, securities trader would be permitted to indirectly manipulate prices. <laughs> Listen, 
you know, if you're struggling with this one, it's going to be a long day at the SIE. Under no circumstances, market manipulation is never okay. Uh, you're not going to get many. Yeah, you know, well, you, you know, that's an aim issue point click question. An investor has received a summary prospectus from his registered rep. What security has the customer purchased? Uh, summary prospectuses are for mutual funds. All the following are subject to MSRB rules, except. Yeah, MSRB, kind of like this question, doesn't have any regulatory authority over issuers. The MSRB has no regulatory authority over issuers. So the school district can, uh, you know, tell the MSRB to pound sand. You know, participants in the municipal market, banks that sell munis, broker dealers that sell munis, not, not so, right? So the answer is A. What will the uh, investor own after exercising the warrant? you will own the common stock. For example, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Hathaway was issued 700 million warrants to buy Bank of America, and they exercised them and got 700 million shares uh, of Bank of America from exercising those warrants. Under the Securities Act of 34, under the Securities Act of 34, the SEC, well, the SEC is God in the securities industry. They regulate the securities exchanges, yes. They require registrations of broker-dealers, yes. They prohibit inequitable and unfair uh, trade practices, yes. They regulate over the counter markets, indeed. So the answer is D. The answer is D. Are hedge funds required to register with the SEC? Well, hedge funds are organized as uh, private partnerships, and they're distributed under Reg D, private placement. And the hedge fund manager is a GP. And typically the fund is not registered with the SEC, but the investment advisor, the general partner is, is a federally covered investment advisor. So let's see what our answer sets are here for this uh, hedge fund. Our uh, hedge funds are required to register with the SEC. All hedges must register except those for the family offices, no. Uh, no, because they're exempt from registration. Yes, if they have more than 35 investors, there's no thing about 35 investors except uh, a 506B private placement. We can have 35 non-accredited investors. Maybe Nobbin is trying to confuse us with that, but uh, the answer here is uh, D by definition. By the way, I just told you they're organized as private partnerships. That means remember, you have to be accredited. An investor is holding callable preferred stock. So this means the issuer can call the preferred stock away from the preferred stockholder. And they're typically going to do that if they can refinance at a lower rate. If they can refinance at a lower rate. And so you should be prepared to negotiate. No. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's going to get called away from you. Now, call risk, that's called call risk, by the way. And that's associated with a declining interest rate environment. At exercise, the customer is obligated to buy stocks. That means you're short. And if you're obligated to buy, you're the put E. That's a short put. I love this answer set. I love this answer set. So again, if you're making notes, you might want to put this in your notes. Short calls, an obligation to sell the stock. Long calls, a choice to buy the stock. Short put is the answer to this question. Obligated to buy the stock. Long put is a choice to sell the stock. We said there are two types of contracts. Calls and puts, you can buy them or sell them. Those are our four basic positions and you will see that answer set on your SIE. So make sure you can perform accordingly. An investor would like to purchase a basket of equity securities with performance leaked to a broad market index. The investor also uh, prefers intraday marketability. That's a weird way to say, you know, you can trade it. And so that means a mutual fund is out. And the E10 is out and the equity linked, uh, well, there's no equity linked K. It could be an equity linked note, right? But uh, yeah, this becomes an ETF. I like that. Investors are concerned about non-systematic risk. Investors are concerned about, that's called selection risk, picking the wrong thing. There were 10 equally uh, suitable ideas. You picked one of the 10, the other nine did fine. And so that's called a selection risk, non-systematic risk. The easiest way to take care of that is to diversify. You know, Bernard Baruch said, money is like manure and you have to spread it around, right? And that way, any one thing doesn't hurt you. And the easiest way test question for you to do that is in a mutual fund. And the only, well, I shouldn't say the only, but the risk that still would prevail is the systematic risk. Systematic risk is the opposite, the tendency of securities prices to move together. So the easiest way to eliminate non-systematic risk or systemic risk 
is through diversification. Uh, the result of higher protection costs due to more expensive raw materials is called cost push. Yeah, what's pushing me to raise my prices is my come at cost. Demand would be, you know, the consumers want more than I can produce. Uh, on debrief, somebody told me they saw this kind of crazy. That they actually saw a question about elasticity of uh, supply and demand. And so that means how does this affect you know, my price affect, you know, the supply and the demand relationship. You know, so for example, uh, if I raise my prices, does the demand go down or not? If if it doesn't go down, then it's ina inelastic, not elastic. If it does, it's elastic. Uh, again, I believe them, but that's kind of a crazy kind of quick question. 16, a public offering, the terms and conditions between the syndicate members are identified. They love to torment you on documents. And that's the agreement amongst the underwriters. Sometimes we call it the syndicate letter. Or well, here they're trying to torment, get you the difference. The underwriting agreement is between the issuer and the uh, the the underwriters. So D is between the issuer and the people underwriting. And then the agreement amongst the underwriters how we're going to conduct ourselves. And then the uh, syndicate uh, letter. The best answer here is B. Uh, I could have missed this pretty easily with a C, but I think they want B. We'll see. A uh, unit investment trust is best described. Boy, uh, they're really doubling up on these uh, unit investment trusts. And uh, we should definitely know it's a fixed portfolio uh, created by the sponsor. So I think that's about the third time we've seen a question like that. It's not a custodian. Custodians just hold monies and securities. They don't professionally select it. So the UIT is a professionally selected portfolio. Uh, the gain that you have closed and is calculated 10 per share. Uh, I kind of like this, right? It's calculated. The customer may buy or sell at a price higher than lower. Yeah, the NAV has nothing to do with the price of a closed-end fund. It's supply and demand. It's supply and demand, right? Whereas the open-end fund, it's based on the next calculation of the NAV. Uh, I don't know about this particular phraseology, but that concept in general is uh, very testable. Uh, 63, when executing a transaction in municipal securities on behalf of a customer as an agent, so that means uh, our brokerage firm is going to go to another brokerage firm and get that security for you, and you're going to owe us a commission for doing so. Uh, firms must make an effort to obtain a price for the customer. Uh, what do we say, right? Always fair and reasonable. You should never be unfair and unreasonable. So I think that's about the second time we've seen that one, I think. I would know that uh, FINRA has what's called a 5% policy, and that just means that brokerage firms have to have a normal pattern to their charges, we just can't be making it up on the fly. And if we're going to charge somebody more, then we better have some reasons for doing so. Well, I think we encountered a question about a non-traded read, and here's one about a publicly traded read. So that means there is a secondary market for this thing. So publicly traded REITs refer to which of the following? Those that file with the SEC and whose shares trade on a stock exchange. I like that. I like that a lot. So let's see what our next choice is. Those that do not file with the SEC, no, if you're going to public security, that's what 33 says. 33 says if you're going to sell brand new securities to the public, you need to make a registration statement. So uh, those that file with the SEC do not trade on a stock. No, but trade means it's on, you know, a market center of some sort, New York, NASDAQ, something like that. Yeah, hey. An investor who buys a T-bond in the OMA market paying 3% interest. The next day, the Fed increases the discount rate in this scenario, the investor would immediately be concerned with, well, as we said, you know, you don't have credit risk, but you certainly have market risk. You know, uh, you know, who would think you could lose so much money in a, a bond portfolio of government securities? But it happens all the time. You know, the Mormon church used to think they were very uh, conservative because all they would buy was be treasuries. And they bought long-term treasuries and then interest rates went up in the 80s. And interest rates went as high as 18%. And they said, oh, that didn't work out so well. So now they're a little more diversified. You have market risk. An institutional uh, account may be able to qualify from an exemption. So an exemption. Uh, all components of the suitability rule. Yeah, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, the quantitative aspect of the suitability rule. The reasonable basis. No, customer specific. In other words, what I mean by that is the institutional investor is capable of protecting their own assets, their own interests. So that would be based on a individual institutional basis. Uh, 67, 
an individual, an individual who has made a trade based on material non-public information. <laughs> right out of the gate, we know this is a problem. She learned from her neighbor which of the following statements are true. Uh, everybody's in trouble, right? The neighbor who shared the uh, information has violated the insider trading rules. True. The individual who made the trade has violated the insider trade rules. Yes. The violators are maybe asked to pay criminal penalties in up to uh, 10 million. No, it's actually 5 million. I don't think the test itself will uh, be as uh, mean spirited as Nobman is on this particular question. Uh, I would definitely know that. Uh, the penalty is three times the what you made, the civil penalties, triple damages. Which of the self-regulatory organizations responsible for monitoring, approving advertising and sales literature? That's called retail communication. The U.S. broker dealers distribute to the public. You should definitely know that's FINRA. And then you should definitely know that if it's a retail communication, it needs to be approved by a principal pre or post distribution. And if it's a, you know, correspondence, it can be approved pre or uh, just pre or post distribution, whatever the uh, principal would like to do. Uh, 69, which of the following statements regarding preferred stocks is true? Uh, one, like common, they have voting rights. You should definitely know preferred stock does not have voting rights. It has preferential treatment and dividends and liquidation. So one is true. That would be a bad miss. It's not true. Excuse me, not true. So that's pretty helpful because now I got to take two. Unlike common, they do, there we go. No voting rights, very testable. Preferred shares typically have greater appreciation potential. Oh, no, no, no. They have less because, you know, they have a fixed or stated rate of return. So that is two and four, two and four. Uh, I get people on debrief tell me they got more preferred stock questions than they were expecting, and I don't know what to make of that. All the following activities are defined as manipulative and fraudulent, except... <laughs> Uh, I kind of like this one. Uh, I kind of like this one. Uh, stock pools where we, uh, you know, are pooling our, our things to do uh, unsavory things. That's that's bad. Uh, you know, on pools are in the, the nature of that is bad. Spoofing is sending uh, artificial, uh, sending buys and sells and canceling them quickly to move the bid and the ask in my favor. So spoofing, that's what spoofing is. And that's fraudulent. Stabilizing. Now that's in the prospectus. This is in a firm commitment on where we tell you in the prospectus that we may stabilize the issue in the secondary market. So it's a, I think of it as a legal form of pegging, keeping the stock at 20. Nobody's going to buy my new stock at 20 if they can get in the open market at 18. So I'm going to stabilize it. It has to be in the prospectus. It's only for firm commitment on writings, and it has to be at or below the uh, public offering price. Uh, again, I think that's more likely a seven question than an SIE question. Uh, trade instruction given by an investor who wants execution and, uh, in the late afternoon uh, would be a market at close. Uh, the one that's more testable there is not held. And that's where you tell the uh, floor broker to do it at whatever time and price uh, they think look good. 73, a 4% municipal bond is trading in the secondary market for 96. So this is a teeter-totter seesaw question. And so remember, we're looking for the current yield is going to be four. No, the current yield, remember, is going to be higher. I'll refer you to uh, your teeter-totter uh, on that. The current yield is 4.17. I should be able to do current yields. I'm getting on my calculator because I'm mathematically challenged. That 4% is based on par, so that's $40. So I'm going to take my calculator. You should be able to do this on the test. I'm going to divide by the current market price. 96 is 96% 96 of par, and that's 960. And current yield is what an investment pays me divided by what it costs me. And so now I get the current yield. By the way, I didn't have to do the math because I should have known current yield is in four because that's the nominal yield. That would only be true if the bond was at par and it's not. So the uh, bond's yield, current yield is less than the yield of maturity. Well, no, if I do my teeter-totter right, I'm going to make some money by holding it to maturity. So the bond's current yield is less than the yield of maturity. Yeah. So it's two and uh, three. I would draw a teeter-totter on this, but I'm trying to bring these explications in in about an hour or so. These aren't teaching tools. And I just would warn you, practice exams, practice tests are not learning tools. They're for you to get a mark to market to see where you're at in terms of needing remediation or not, right? So, you know, sometimes people get bad advice. I'll oh, just do a bunch of practice tests. 
you know, it's aggravating to me. You shouldn't be in the playlist for practice tests until you've laid some base knowledge, right? They're two separate playlists. And I can kind of tell by the content of your questions, whether you've laid base, because sometimes people ask me questions, I go, Ooh, you know, that's not a good question. So try and lay your base before you start getting these marks of where you're at on the information. In evaluating the credit or revenue bonds, it's most relevant to uh, the taxing authority. And eh, that's a bad mess. I recommend you take a sheet of paper and on one side, write all the terms associated with GOs. On the other, all the terms associated with revenues, because a big part is, uh, you know, distinguishing between those two. The financial guarantee provided by the state or county standing by in the bond. No, again, that would be a double barrel bond. That'd be a type of GO. The feasibility study. Yeah, feasibility study goes with a revenue bond. So C. Uh, when customer and firm owned securities are combined, this is a practice that's known. <laughs> Your securities, my securities, what does it matter? <laughs> well, no, it matters, right? I'll treat your securities as if, they, as if they were my own. Please don't, <laughs> right? So indeed that is called commingling and that's a violation. So segregation is a good word. That means we keep customers' monies and securities separate from the broker dealers' monies and securities. So segregation is good, commingling is bad. Uh, 75, two bonds have relatively equal credit quality in terms of maturity. Which of the following statements is true? Uh, the bond with a higher coupon will trade at a lower price. No, a higher income stream is more desirable. The bonds are all equal. Don't ever tell me something's equal because they, they wouldn't be asking the question if that were true. The bond with a lower coupon is more liquid. No, we said a higher coupon, a higher interest, a higher income stream is more valuable. So it's D. By the way, they would also hold its value more. Another way to say the same thing, right? Uh, rule 145. Well, I'll tell you, Notman is uh, something. They've got a couple of questions here. I wouldn't expect you to encounter on the SIE, but you know, hey, they must have some reason for having this. Uh, that's just my little egg timer telling me we're at an hour. So, you know, that's, I'm trying to bring these explications in in a timely fashion. Uh, but uh, now you know, right? I guess. Uh, propose a reclassify ownership structure as a merger with another company. So, you know, this says you have to let shareholders vote on those reorganizations. Like a tri, this is, by the way, it's called a triangular merger. merger. If we're going to have a new entity. So the answer is A. Uh, I, like I say, I think that's low probability. Uh, what is the nominal yield? Uh, well, again, they're giving you extra extraneous information that you don't need. You know, all you need to know is that it's $40 per dollars is based on par, which is 1,000. And so that would be 4%. I kind of like that as testing on what's relevant, what's not relevant. Uh, which of the following is correspondence according, according to MSRB rules? A uh, letter to a client, you know, is uh, again considered correspondence. You remember the point about correspondence is if it's 25 or fewer. And remember, I told you the point about being correspondence, 25 or fewer, is a principal can approve it pre or post distribution. Where if it goes to uh, more than 25, then it becomes retail communication. It's required to be approved pre distribution. Uh, you're going to get a question like this. So the marker maker has a quote of 10, 10, 25. So 10 is my bid, 10, 25 is my ask. It's from my perspective. I'm telling you, I'll buy 10 round lots into my inventory at 10. A round lot is 100. So that's 1,000 on my bid. And I'll buy 50, sell 15 round lots at 10, 25. 15 round lots, round lots, 100 shares. The 10 by 15 is called the size of my quote. So this is very testable. You are going to encounter a question almost verbatim like this. So uh, what am I obligated to do as a market maker? I'm obligated by 10 round lots at 10. Yes. And sell 15 round lots at 1025. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Now, this one is important enough that I'm going to go ahead and go through those wrong answers with you. Sell 10 at 1025. No, right? I don't sell... I don't have to sell 10. I have to sell 15 and buy 15 at 10. No, I'm only good for 10. So that's not accurate. Buy 10 shares. No, 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 no. You can toss out C and D. Listen, if you said C or D, I think I would probably flunk you. I would have your seat shoot you into the ceiling and say, how'd you miss that? Because you should definitely know there's no such thing as a round lot of 10 or D. That means you haven't laid the base again that we were just talking about. That is very much a test question. By the way, if you have in our, you know, one of the things that's great about our playlist in the uh, YouTube channel 
is when you were doing your test geek practice final, uh, Gnopin, uh, Kaplan, Momentrix, one thing you're looking for is confirmation of test issues. So if you see every test prep vendor has a question like 79, that's a hint that it's on the test, right? So that's the uh, the good thing of having so many different kind of uh, test prep vendors. So shout out to all, all who have allowed us to have uh, access to their content, uh, including Nopman in this exam, uh, Test Geek, uh, Momentrix, Kaplan. Uh, there's one of my own in there as well. But, you know, I'm not going to give a shout out to myself. Maybe I will. <laughs> Anyways, that's B, right? A summary perspective is it gives you the highlights, the most pertinent information, not all of it, but, you know, enough to make a decision. 81. All the following statements regarding organization. Wow, man, I don't know if uh, Notman's had some debrief. The UITs are big time test fodder lately or something, but uh, this seems pretty heavy on UITs. So I don't know how they picked this out uh, for us. You know, they were kind enough to say, Dean, we'll send you one you can do. This is the one they sent me. And I said, thank you very much. So maybe they have like a randomizer or something. And we just happen to pull one that has uh, some uh, lots of UIT questions. Anyways, the trust must register under 33. So remember this is accept. Accept, and that means we do. We're selling brand new securities of public. The securities being held and are selected to meet us. Yeah, they're professionally selected. B is true. The trust indentures the document that initiates the formation of a trust. That is true. Uh, no, they're not actively managed. So we keep getting tested on this idea that they're passively managed. Uh, mortgage REITs, mortgage REIT. So real estate investment offers investors the potential for all the following except. Recovering the housing markets, yeah. Ownership interest. Now we don't have an ownership interest in properties, right? We're buying mortgages. We're issuing, we're holding mortgages. So now we're holding ownership interest in real estate. A firm's uh, procedures for the free flow of information, material, non-public information. Ooh, this is testable. Uh, firm's procedures to protect the free flow of material, non-public information to trading and sales department. Prohibit or restrict the purchase of sales or securities on the watch list. Mm. Permit the purchase or sale of securities on the watch list, but subject to scrutiny. There we go. That two is better than one, right? That's, you know, we're keeping an eye on to make sure that people that are trading these in the everyday routine of business don't aren't doing it because of other reasons. Prohibit or restrict purchase or sales securities on the restricted list. Indeed, so that's two and three. An individual who worked for a broker dealer for the last five years must complete the regulatory element. It's now annually by December 31st. And so it uh, looks like uh, Notman is on, on the ball here in terms of updating uh, their content. Uh, 85 is very testable. That's very much on the test, which the following is below. So be careful whether they say below which or below. But they said below which, it'd be below triple B, which is double B. This doesn't say below which. It says which one of these is uh, below investment grade, and that's going to be double B. So uh, very much um, uh, a good practice exam. Uh, I will put the uh, answer key in the uh, video description. And uh, again, thank you so much. Remember, inch by inch, your SIE is a sense, yard by yard, your SIE is hard. Uh, shout out to Notman Marks. I will put the link uh, to Notman's SIE content and the discount code for 10% off a uh, Notman. I'm not sure. They just gave that to me uh, today. So I'm not sure if it works for everything or if it just works for the SIE. <laughs> I'll try and see. Uh, it's not user friendly. It's not like my discount code at Kaplan Guru 10 or my discount code at Teske Guru 20. It's a, a longer string of digits. So <laughs> anyways, try it out. If you're buying any Notman products and services and uh, uh, see if it works. And uh, I'll see you for the uh, next explication uh, for SIE. And if you matriculate for your SIE, I'll see you on your six or your seven. Bye-bye.